This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is Southern Remedy Kids and Teens on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Morgan McLeod, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine at UMMC. High blood pressure, also known as hypertension, is a very common chronic disease that we see in our adult patients. But unfortunately, we're starting to see it happen more and more in our kids and teens. And so today we're going to talk about high blood pressure. We're going to talk about the causes, um, some of the symptoms, some of the long-term effects we see of high blood pressure. And we're also going to talk about some of the treatments. But we're always going to be taking your questions and comments, so we would love to hear from you. You can always send us an email as well to kids at mpbonline.org. So I felt like it had been a little bit since we had talked about high blood pressure and thought it'd be a pretty good time to talk about it now with the holidays around the corner. Uh, We're going to be eating more. And this is when we see a lot of times people coming into the hospital, unfortunately, um, with problems related to Uh, high blood pressure, heart problems, strokes, that type of thing, because people aren't always watching what they eat this time of year. And so I thought it'd be pretty good to go on and start talking about this, uh, because we know, I want to hit on talking about sodium in particular, because we know there is a connection between sodium and blood pressure. Uh, So that's where we see a lot of the trouble coming in around the holidays. Uh, We were actually talking about that with some of our uh, residents the other day when we were I was talking to them about uh, what holidays to work and how you always see people come in around Thanksgiving and Christmas time with heart failure problems uh, because of all the sodium that they've taken in just with all the eating that we do over the holidays so before we go to the holidays thought this would be a good time to talk about this So hypertension, that's the fancy term that we use for high blood pressure. Um, So if you hear your doctor say hypertension, that's what they mean. They're talking about high blood pressure. But hypertension is not just one blood pressure reading. So that's something important to know. Our blood pressure fluctuates all throughout the day. Um, Certain situations may make your blood pressure go a little bit higher uh, than normal. So if you're in a stressful environment, Um, If you're having at work, maybe, or maybe you're having a stressful time with some family members in certain situations, you may notice that your blood pressure is running a little bit higher than normal. What we consider hypertension is when it is consistently running that high. So if you're having a stressful event, your blood pressure is running a little bit high, but a week or two later, things are better and moving in the right direction, you recheck your blood pressure and it's back to normal then we don't consider that hypertension. Um, This is more of a consistent elevation in your blood pressure. And so what are the numbers? Uh, So it depends on who you look at, but most people go by the American Heart Association's guidelines, which is what most of the internal medicine doctors follow. And we're going to say less than 120 over 80 is going to be ideal. Anything with that top number greater than 130 or that bottom number greater than 80 is what we consider uh, stage one hypertension. Anything with the top number above 140 or that bottom number above 90 is what we consider stage two hypertension. So that's for adults. Um, For our kids, we look at, it's a little more complicated uh, because, you know, with kids, everything is based off of weight Um, and percentages. That's kind of how we do things with our children uh, because not every kid is the same. Uh, So what we look at is we look at their, we obviously we look at their blood pressure numbers, but we also take into account their gender and we take into account their age and their height percentages. And so there's this big fancy table that we have that kind of lets us know where your, where your child falls based off of that. And so we plug it in, we look and we see boy versus girl, Um, we look at the age, and then we scroll over to the height percentages. And so based off of that, we can see kind of where your kids should fall for their blood pressure range. 
And anything above the 95th percentile for that would be considered high blood pressure. Once you hit age 13, so once you hit to be a teenager, we do the same uh, numbers as adults, just for simplicity's sake. But if your child is under 13, which I know that sounds crazy to think of a little kid having high blood pressure, but we see it all the time, unfortunately. Under 13, we have to look at that big fancy chart. So it's kind of hard to tell you, does your child have high blood pressure just by looking at the number? Um, you know, after you've been doing it a while, you can kind of like recognize when certain numbers may be a little bit higher for certain ages. But to truly know for sure if your child has hypertension, we have to look at that chart, see where they fall on that chart. And if they do, if they have um, hypertension based off of that. Um, so that's kind of an overview of hypertension and what the numbers are because I feel like everybody's always asking numbers and what what should their goal be and I think a lot of times as doctors we don't really do a great job of telling people um, what we want to be uh, you know I'll ask patients like uh, what do you think your blood pressure should be or um, for diabetes patients what do you think your a1c should be and most people don't know. Um, so that it kind of falls on us as physicians that we don't do a very good job of educating on what the numbers look like. Uh, but that's kind of where we should see. Now, there's going to be some leniency in those numbers, um, especially depending on your age. Um, the older you get, we do kind of be a little bit more lenient on your blood pressure. Um, but here recently, uh, the American Heart Association has tried to make us be a little bit more aggressive than we used to be as you get older. So we're not we're not as lenient as we used to be, but we're still not as strict as we are on you know somebody who's in their 30s and has high blood pressure. Um, so why is high blood pressure such an important topic? Um, it's because it causes a lot of problems, and it doesn't cause problems until it's too late. So you've probably heard the term out there, silent killer. That's what everybody likes to say about high blood pressure, the silent killer. Uh, makes it sound terrible. But what happens is over time, the longer that pressure stays high in your blood vessels, the more damage is done. So you may be diagnosed with high blood pressure in, say, your 40s, maybe um, some people not till their 50s, but they aren't going to have problems with it until they're, you know, late 60s, 70s, most of the time. Um, we do have some that are diagnosed, you know, in their 20s and 30s, and so we're seeing people with heart failure in their 40s and 50s. Uh, but the thing about high blood pressure is majority of the time, you're not going to have a problem when it first starts being high. It's going to be over time that this is happening. And so that's why it's so important to make sure you're going to your doctor at least once a year, having your blood pressure screened, because you may feel totally fine. Our bodies do a great job at adjusting to those changes in pressure. So most people, when they come see me and I tell them their blood pressure is high, they can't believe it because they feel fine. Or if I diagnose them with diabetes, they are like, well, I feel fine. But it, our bodies do such a good job at kind of making you go back into a equilibrium kind of state where you feel fine, even though your blood pressure is high. And so you don't realize it. And so that's why it's so important to make sure you're getting your screenings and know what your blood pressure is running. Um, we've got a caller, so we'll go to James in Gulfport. Good morning, James. What's going on? Um, yes, I'm 85 years old, and I never took blood pressure medication until a, a year ago. But uh, when, a year ago, my blood pressure was taken by my urologist, and it was 200 over 90. Well, that's pretty impressive that you made it to 85, number one, without having to get on any <laughs> blood pressure medicine. So kudos to yes. you. Um, but so so I, I, he told me to get a, a regular physician, which I did, and she put me on a medication with, of about 20 milligrams of uh, Leprinosil, and it didn't bring it down very much. And so she raised it to um, 40, and it brought it down maybe a little bit more. But um, then she, she decided the side effects from it from cause, causing me to cough a lot, um, she changed me to Losartan. Mm -hmm. And Losartan, she put me on that with 50 milligrams. And then my last blood pressure was still like 176 over 90. 
And uh, so she offered to move it up to uh, 100 uh, on the low sartan, up to 100 milligrams. Uh, but she said, that's as high as that goes, that medication goes. And, and I told her um, I didn't want to go that high, that, um, that I would rather live with high blood pressure rather than risk it going down to low blood pressure. So um, that's where I am. And so I've been taking blood pressure medication. I take it every morning at 7 o'clock. And, um, and she said, that's what I should continue to do, and that's what I'm doing. And she said, acceptable for my age, um, anything 150 over uh, 90 was acceptable. But I'm still up around 176. So I just wonder, is this just a, a problem of being old and there is, it will never return to normal again? <laughs> Well, what do you think? so I think there's a couple of things, James, going on. Number one, at being at 85, um, the older you get, the little bit stiffer our blood vessels get. And so just by default, your blood pressure goes a little bit higher just because your blood your blood vessels are just a little bit stiffer. Um, you bring up some good points in that, you know, you talked about how high your top number was. Um, so you said it was like 200, but your bottom number was only 90, which is it, which is high, but it's not as high as the top number being 200. So we see this a lot as patients get older. Um, there is a bigger discrepancy between that top number and that bottom number. And so we have to be careful when we're lowering your blood pressure that way because we want that top number to come down, but we also don't want to drop that bottom number too low, and it can make you feel bad. Um, because yeah. honestly, that bottom number is when it's the pressure when your heart fills with blood. So it's it's very important, too. That top number is when your heart pumps the blood to your body, but the bottom number is when your pressure when your heart fills with blood so you got to kind of find that balance um so it sounds like she's done a really good job of bringing that top number down some but also helping keep your bottom number not too low um the other thing is is sometimes when you have blood pressure more than what we say 20 points above what goal would be uh, which yours is most of the time it takes two different medications to do that um, we have, oh my gosh, there's probably at least eight different classes of blood pressure medications. And so sometimes you have to work on it from two different angles to bring it down appropriately. So we can, you know, sh max you out on certain medicines, but a lot of times we kind of have to hit it from another angle too um, to bring that blood pressure down all the way. So it may be that you can stay on that low sartan kind of at that medium dose of 50 but maybe just want to add a little low dose of another medicine, and that may could bring you down just a little bit more. Uh, that low sart, yeah. that low sartan medicine, or that class of medicines that low sartan is, it's in a combination of several different medicines. So you could still only end up taking one pill, but it would be like a two in one pill. And I think you probably could bring it down just a little bit more and hopefully not make you feel too crummy. But I agree with her. I wouldn't probably bring that top number down much less than 150. Um, I think that's safe for you. Oh, well, well, thank you very much. You answered all the questions that I had. Yeah, well, good. <laughs> well, I, well, hopefully. I was, I, I was delighted when I heard that you were going to be talking about blood pressure today. I listen to you every every time you're on. Well, thank you so much, James. We appreciate it. Well, hopefully hopefully they can get it figured out. But, yeah, I think maybe you may need to have another one added, um, and that could hopefully bring your blood pressure down safely just a little bit more. Okay. Well, thank you so much. All right. Have a good day. Thank you, James. We are talking today about high blood pressure. If you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email to kids at mpbonline.org. So we had another caller call in, but they weren't able to stay on the line, um, and so they wanted to ask a question. Um, and their question was, what are the effects of blood pressure of, uh, they had three different things, of coffee, of marijuana, and vaping on high blood pressure? 
Um, so the first one, coffee, is that one's a pretty easy one because it's got caffeine in it. I guess if you get decaf, I would have to look it up a little bit more and just make sure none of the contents would. But majority of the coffee drinkers out there, you're drinking it because you want the caffeine. Um, and the caffeine, we know, raises blood pressure. So for sure, that medica- um, coffee can raise your blood pressure. If you're going to put a bunch of the other stuff that goes in your coffee, too, that can also probably some of those things could potentially raise your blood pressure depending on what the component of it was. Um, Some of those flavors and different things that they use, if you go to the fancy coffee shops, um, probably have some sodium in them as well, and that can raise your blood pressure. But we know caffeine for sure can raise your blood pressure. Um, Marijuana, particularly smoking marijuana, can raise your blood pressure. Um, I don't know about all the other, you know, the newer forms of um, THC out there with the with the gummies and edibles and all the different things that are coming out now. How much information we know about those just yet? Um, looking through the CDC's website just to see if they had any information, and and they pretty much said the same thing that um, that smoking marijuana can directly raise your blood pressure but is it the THC or is it the smoking of it necessarily because um, you know any kind of irritant like that can raise your blood pressure so they're probably especially now as medical marijuana is becoming and marijuana in general is becoming more legal and especially in more forms particularly the edible forms we're probably going to have to have better studies on that to see kind of what those effects are in blood pressure but smoking marijuana which is what we typically think of with marijuana um, at least in the past can directly raise your blood pressure and the same with vaping Um, we know that um, the nicotine can do that and majority of the vaping fluids are going to have nicotine in there Um, and so that can directly raise your blood pressure too and the same with cigarettes tobacco raises your blood pressure as well so pretty much all of those things that he called about will raise your blood pressure but again the only one I'm not 100% sure on is going to be like the other forms of marijuana particularly the edibles um, and like what kind of effect that's going to have long term on your blood pressure so I guess as more it becomes more readily available, we'll be able to do more studies on it and we'll be able to know. Um, but for now, I don't know a ton that there is a ton of information out there about it just yet. But thank you for that question and that call. I was talking about how high blood pressure is the silent killer. That's the term we always hear for it um, because you don't always feel bad necessarily when your blood pressure is elevated. It's very common for people to have no idea that their blood pressure is high. Um, but we know that over time it's doing damage. And so I was saying that the, the what the blood pressure is is essentially the pressure that is in the blood vessels. And if that pressure stays high over time, it causes damage to those blood vessels. Particularly the blood vessels we think about are going to be the heart, the kidneys, and the brain um, because those are the three big organs that can be affected by high blood pressure long term. Um, so I found some statistics that for the first heart attack, about seven out of every 10 people that have their first heart attack have high blood pressure. Um, For a stroke, eight out of every 10 people who had their first stroke have high blood pressure. Um, Seven out of 10 people with heart failure also have high blood pressure. Couldn't find numbers for kidney disease, but I would have to say majority of people that are on dialysis and have chronic kidney disease, it's, are are gonna have high blood pressure. Very rare, um, do you not? So um, very, very common for high blood pressure to be related to all these different disease processes that we were talking about. Um, One out of every three adults in the U.S. is going to have high blood pressure, which is kind of crazy. I'm sitting here looking right now, and it's like, uh, you know, three of us right now between (laughs) me and and Jay and the uh, the caller. So one of us is probably going to have high blood pressure at some point. I don't know. Maybe one of y'all do. Um, so I'm, I feel certain I probably will. Both of my parents have high blood pressure. So probably at some point in my life I will. But yeah, one out of every three, which is kind of crazy when you think about that. Kids, about 3.5% of all kids and teens right now have high blood pressure. So that's not a lot, but that number is definitely rising. So I'm not sure what that number will be in the next five years, maybe even higher. 
feel like my idea of kids and teens having high blood pressure is a little skewed uh, because at our med peds clinic out at umc that's one of the things that we do is we take care of kids with high blood pressure so we see it a fair amount um, but in the real world it's not as crazy as it is, uh, but we see a pretty good bit of it. We see a lot of referrals um, from across the state with kids with high blood pressure. So it's definitely happening. So what do you do? How do you check your blood pressure? Because I feel like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, as physicians, we probably don't do the best job of telling you what numbers to look for. We also don't do a really good job of telling you how to check your blood pressure. There's lots of different blood pressure monitors out there. Um, so we'll get a lot of questions about that. Like, is there any particular one that's the best? Not really. Um, Omron is the brand that we use in our clinics, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the kind of blood pressure monitor that you have to use. There's lots of different ones out there. Um, there are some blood pressure cuffs that are arm cuffs, and then there's some that are wrist cuffs. Now, there is a difference between those that can be an important. So those wrist cuffs are not going to be as accurate as the arm blood pressure cuffs. And that's because the further you get away from your heart, usually the higher your blood pressure is going to be. So if you check your blood pressure consistently in your wrist, it's probably going to be falsely a little bit higher than it would be if you were checking it in your arm. So that's just something to know. The other thing is you want to make sure that your blood pressure cuff fits your arm. So if your blood pressure cuff is too big for your arm, then you're going to have falsely low numbers. If your blood pressure cuff is too small for your arm, you're going to have falsely high numbers. So just something to think about. You want to make sure that the blood pressure cuff fits your arm appropriately so that you can make sure that you're getting the most accurate numbers. So ideally, you're going to have an arm cuff. You're going to have been sitting for at least five minutes, which I know sounds like a long time, but like I had mentioned earlier, our blood pressure fluctuates so much throughout the day and then throughout certain situations. So if you have been, you know, cleaning your kitchen or walking around your house, putting up laundry, whatever it may be, or maybe you just got home from work and you just sit down and take your blood pressure, your blood pressure is probably going to be a little bit elevated. So you need to let your body have some time to regulate, to calm down, and then after about three to five minutes, you can take your blood pressure. You want to make sure you're sitting and that you have both feet on the floor. And the other thing is don't talk when you're taking your blood pressure. Um, if, you're ta if you're talking as, you're ta as the machine is taking your blood pressure, that also can affect it and can raise your blood pressure a little bit higher than it normally should be. So sitting with both feet on the ground, having sitting for at least five minutes, trying to be as relaxed as possible, and try not to talk during it, and take your blood pressure. You want to make sure that you try to take your blood pressure around the same time every day. Um, it doesn't have to be exact because everybody's day is different. Um, but if you can try to keep it around the same time, and I usually tell people to shoot for around a couple of hours after you would take your blood pressure medicine. So if you take your blood pressure medicine in the morning, um, you know, a couple of hours after you would take your blood pressure medications. Um, if you take your blood pressure medicines at night, that's fine. You want to take your blood pressure, you know, right after you wake up in the morning. That would probably give you the, the more accurate um, reading for your blood pressure. You don't have to take your blood pressure multiple times a day. If you took your blood pressure, you know, four and five times a day, you're going to see those swings in your blood pressure. You're going to see you're going to have some good numbers, some bad numbers, good numbers, bad numbers. Um, so we don't recommend really checking it multiple times throughout the day. That being said, if you're feeling bad or you think something's off, feel free to do that. But Ideally, you would just check it once a day around the same time so that we can kind of know how it's running around that same time every day. Um, looks like we've got another caller. Miss Sue is on the line. Hey, Miss Sue, what's going on this morning? Hi, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, what causes venous insufficiency and what can be done about it? Yeah, so venous insufficiency or chronic venous stasis is kind of the term that we think about. Um, most people, it's going to be in their legs, and their legs get swollen. Sometimes you'll see some changes in the skin. Um, maybe some people get redness. Some people get kind of like a bluish purpley color, too. And if it gets really, really bad and swollen, it can even, like, open up and weep a little bit. 
That's not really directly related to blood pressure um, because blood pressure is more the arteries, and this is more your veins. So the difference between the arteries and the veins is, so the arteries take blood away from your heart into the parts of the body, and the veins bring blood back to the heart. So the arteries are pumping that blood through to your body. So they're a little bit more muscular and strong as opposed to the veins. They're a little bit more floppy in general. They don't have as much muscle in the walls of those veins. The veins to help bring blood back to the heart kind of rely on us to get up and move around and help push that blood back. And so what happens is um, as you get older, those veins that aren't already very strong typically get a little bit more flimsy. And so you tend to pull blood in those veins a little bit more than you normally do. Um, and so that's what happens is if you especially, you'll notice people that have venous stasis or venous insufficiency, um, it's worse if they're sitting with their feet down all day as opposed to if they're up and moving around or if they have some compression stocking zone because when you're up and moving around or you have compression stocking zone, it squeezes those veins and helps move that fluid and that blood back to your heart as opposed to if you're just sitting down then those poor little veins that aren't very strong, that blood and that fluid just pulls down in there. Does that make sense? Yes, you explained it very well. I appreciate that. Yeah, and then when that blood just pulls like that, that's when you get those skin changes. And then, like I said, if it gets really bad, it can actually open up and weep some, and then people get infections. So it's really important if you have that to make sure you're getting up and moving or just get some compression stockings. Compression stockings are not fun, but they make a world of difference for people with uh, venous stasis. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Miss Sue, for calling. This is Southern Remedy Kids and Teens on MPB Think Radio. We have been talking about high blood pressure. If you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can always send an email to kids at mpbonline.org. So we talked about what causes high blood pressure, some of the complications we see from high blood pressure. And we talked about how to take your blood pressure and what numbers to look for. But now, what do you do when you find out you have high blood pressure? So you've been checking your blood pressure, and um, it is high, and the doctor agrees that you probably have a diagnosis of hypertension. So what do we do now? Um, because you don't want to have any of those complications that we talked about earlier. So first things first is just what we call lifestyle changes. I always tell people, contrary to popular belief, doctors are really not always trying to give you medications. Um, if we can treat your blood pressure, if we can treat your diabetes without having to use a medicine, I promise you we will. We really don't like to have to give medicines if we don't have to. So what we start with is what we call lifestyle modifications. Um, so lifestyle modifications are going to be increasing your exercise and also watching what you eat. Those are going to be the two biggest things. We know if you're overweight and you're obese, we know that there's a direct relationship between high blood pressure. Um, if you're overweight, then the higher your blood pressure is going to be. It's just kind of how it is. Uh, we know not getting enough physical activity, which can make you gain weight, which will ultimately make your blood pressure go up. That can also have problems. Uh, we know one of our callers, you know, earlier we talked about smoking. Smoking can raise your blood pressure. Um, drinking alcohol can raise your blood pressure. Drinking a lot of caffeine can raise your blood pressure. Um, sleep apnea, that's one that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, you, people just think about sleep apnea as snoring. Um, but in reality, sleep apnea is doing damage to the, your blood vessels as well over time. And so that can also raise your blood pressure. So that's something, you know, we try to work in. We try to get you to quit smoking, get you to quit drinking. If we have a suspicion that you could have sleep apnea, we try to get you to the right doctor to get you a CPAP machine to help you get that uh, sleep apnea better controlled. But the biggest thing is going to be losing weight and changing your diet. Those are going to be the two biggest things that we are really going to try to work on to help bring your blood pressure down. Um, but we've got a caller, so I'm going to go to Donna in Natchez. Good morning, Donna. Good morning. What's going on this morning? 
Oh, just a nice drive down to New Orleans. But my question is, how common is high blood pressure in kids, and what medications can they not take to treat their high blood pressure? So the statistic that I found is 3.5% of kids and teens are going to have high blood pressure. Um, I, I feel like that's probably actually a little bit higher. But again, my my idea of it's a little skewed because that's what I do as a med peds physician is we get referred kids that have high blood pressure. So we see it, we probably see at least one to two a day. So I guess mine is a little okay. skewed of that. But I would say probably around 5% of kids. It's really not that many, but it's 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 getting higher. We're seeing it more and more in our kids. Mm -hmm. With regards to medicines, um, there is a few medicines out there that we avoid in kids. Uh, for the most part, the, the number one that we use, I feel like, is going to be amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. It's a very common mm -hmm. blood pressure medicine. Um, that we use in our adults as well. But it's a good one in kids because uh, it, it works very, uh, pretty good and it doesn't have that many side effects. Um, the only ones we really avoid is going to be the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. Um, and that's really okay. going to be in our teenage girls. The reason being is those are teratogenic, which means if you get pregnant and you're on those medications, it can cause damage to the baby, particularly with their kidneys. Um, so those are medicines that we typically avoid, mostly just in teenage girls, though. Um, I'm a little hesitant to start with like a diuretic medication for our kids, especially like athletes, um, because diuretics, you know, make you pee and so you can become a little more dehydrated and in some of our athletes I try to be a, a little careful with those medicines not to say that we can't use them you just have to be careful with it but really other than the ACE and ARBs and teenage girls I mean kids can take pretty much any medication that the adults take well hopefully that answered your question Donna and have a great time in New Orleans I'm jealous of your trip that sounds fun uh don't eat too much down there because that's what we had. So a few weeks ago, apparently, there was a, a fried chicken festival in New Orleans. And um, we had a patient come in all swollen. And I said, she said she had just gone back from New Orleans. And I had heard about the, the festival um, from somebody else. And so we, we kind of asked her about it and called her out on it a little bit. And sure enough, that's where she had been and had eaten a little too much sodium. <laughs> uh, just a festival for fried chicken. Apparently, it's put on by um, Canes because, you know, Canes mm -hmm. originated down in, in Louisiana. Yeah. But they bring all kinds of vendors in. So it's not just Canes. It's like all kinds of vendors coming in doing all kinds of chicken and just nothing things. but fried chicken i don't know like all the, the greatest details. thing of all time I don't I, know. Know. I don't I think they have other foods too but I don't know all the details of it but Why? I know it's <laughs> I know, right <laughs> it's sponsored by canes I know so but yeah so you, be careful down there yeah. there are lots of salty stuff down there in New Orleans with jambalaya and red beans and rice and delicious yeah, like they needed more food yeah no, but right. I guess that's how you go over the top of all the food you would you would already have is yeah a fried chicken festival. Yep, 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 yep. We have been talking about blood pressure and hypertension. If you have any questions or comments, you can always send us an email to kids at mpbonline.org. Um, so we had a caller call that didn't have a chance to stay on the line and had a question about, is it better to take your blood pressure medicines at night or in the morning? Um, and I, it all depends on, um, number one, what medication you're taking, and number two, if you're having to take your medicines more than one time a day. Um, there's a few medicines out there that we recommend that you have to take two, sometimes three times a day. And so for those, you don't really have an option. You kind of have to take them both at the morning and at night. Um, if you're on one of those diuretic medications, like I was talking about earlier, um, one of the side effects of those diuretic medicines, not only do they lower your blood pressure, but they make you urinate more frequently. And so a lot of times people don't like to take those at night just because of the side effects of those medicines. <clears throat> so typically we would say take that in the morning um, just to help you with that. As with all the other medicines, um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel blockers um, are going to be our more common ones. It, it really doesn't matter. I tell people to mainly do it based off of what works best for them. I'm a better ta medicine taker at night. 
Um, some people are better at taking medicine in the morning. Um, all of, most of those medications are going to be 24 hours, so theoretically it shouldn't make that much of a difference. Um, although I think there is some new research out there that has shown that potentially taking medications at night may be actually a little bit better. Um, but I, as far as I know, there has been no official recommendation that you should take all of your medicines at night just yet um, because studies are starting to point to that direction. Uh, but for the most part, we still tell, tell people to take it just with whatever works best for your schedule. Um, I tell people, whatever is going to get you to take the medicine, that's when you should take it. Um, and also how you tolerate it, too. That's the other thing. Some people tolerate it a little bit better if they take it at nighttime. So um, a lot of people do end up leaning towards taking it at night. But overall, there's really no consensus just yet, although it seems like more and more research is starting to point to probably taking it at night. Um, we've got some callers, so I think it's Dylan? D Dylan. Yes. Hey, Dylan, what's going on? Nothing but, uh, I just got a, a quick question for two of them. Um, I, I must have been told wrong because I heard that uh, the, when they talk about sodium in your diet, it wasn't so much as the salt we cook with, but it, it was more of uh, processed food. Mm -hmm. So that, that's not true? Yes, yes. Processed foods, well, I mean, it's any sodium in general, but majority of our processed foods are going to be the ones that are higher in sodium. So some of the more natural foods, um, you know, there are some vegetables and fruits that are going to have a higher sodium count in them, um, but it's definitely not going to be as high as like processed foods or um, like some of our vegetables that we get that are canned have tons of sodium in them just because of the preservatives and the processed foods. Okay, and, and the other one is uh, I've had high blood pressure for a long time. And I've never really got it regulated, and I just found out that I have asthma. Can, can that affect my blood pressure? Um, maybe a little, but not, not directly, I wouldn't think. Now, some of the medications that we give for asthma can raise your blood pressure, so that would probably be the more of the link. Um, not necessarily as much of like the process that's going on in your lungs, uh, but definitely, certainly some of the medications that we give you for asthma can raise your blood pressure. Okay, so the, the fact that I'm not getting all the air in that I need, that doesn't make the heart or whatever have to pump heart or anything? It, it may play a role in it if it's very uncontrolled, but if you're if you're just now finding out about it, then it's probably not too terribly controlled. Um, and so I wouldn't think it was playing that much of a role. Now, if you have like um, sleep apnea, that definitely can play a role in it too. Um, so I don't know if you've been tested for that as well, but that probably plays more of a role, I would say, than than um, asthma would. But I guess it could affect it some, but not as much as the medications or, say, like a, a sleep apnea would. Okay. And is it common for, because I've had it for at least 15 years, and I've never gotten it under control. I've, set, I've taken several different medications. I'm, I'm, I'm on like four of them right now, and it's still not really. I mean, it's, it's always like 160 over 90 or, or better, higher. So, I mean, is, is, it, is it common for it not being able to get your uh, your blood pressure under control? It all depends on every, you know, everybody's different, but I think they say majority of people, it takes about two to three blood pressure medicines to get it under control. Um, so, you know, four is definitely a little bit more than, than, than normal. Um, the other thing I would make sure is that somebody has done a, what we call a secondary hypertension workup. So anytime you've been in four medicines or more, we want to make sure there's nothing else causing it. So we want to make sure your hormone levels are all okay. We want to check your heart, check your kidneys, the blood vessels to your kidneys. Um, there's several different things that we would check, but you want to make sure that somebody has worked you up for potentially other causes of the high blood pressure once you get on four or more. Uh, but, yeah, majority of people, it's going to take two to three medicines to get their blood pressure down, unfortunately. Uh, but hopefully that helped and answered some of your questions. We'll go next to Trish. Good morning, Trish. Good morning, good morning. I wanted each of your opinion on sports drinks or energy drinks. Um, in regards to blood pressure or just overall thoughts? Regard to blood pressure, but overall also, but blood pressure specifically. 
So definitely the energy drinks you have to be careful with um, because they have a lot of caffeine in them, um, which can raise your blood pressure. So you have to be very careful with that. Not to say that you can't drink them if you have high blood pressure, for sure, um, because people do all the time just like they drink cafe, um, caffeinated coffee. But you just have to do everything in moderation. So I would not be the person that goes out there and drinks two and three Red Bulls a day. But if you need, you know, just one caffeinated drink a day, I think that should be fine with your high blood pressure. The sports drinks should be okay too as well. But you just have to look at some of the contents of those. Because some of those have a lot of electrolytes in them. So you want to make sure that you're checking on that to make sure it's not a ton of sodium and potassium in there. Um, you got to look for that just to make sure all that's okay. But I mean, everything in moderation should be fine. Um, as long as you're, you know, not doing this all day, every day. Um, if you drink it a few times a week, it shouldn't really cause that much of a problem. And those sports drinks too also have a ton of sugar in them. Um, and so do the energy drinks as well. So you got to look out for that as well. While it's not sodium and directly related to the blood pressure, you know, we talked about your weight, um, and being overweight can definitely raise your blood pressure. So if you're drinking these sugary drinks all the time, you're going to get put on weight, um, which can raise your blood pressure too. So I don't think it's a terrible thing, but they're probably not the best for you to drink. Uh, but if you just have to have those, you need something other than water, um, as long as you do it in moderation, I think it should be okay. Yeah, we'll go next to Barbara. Good morning, Barbara. I wanted to ask you uh, which one of these medications was a diuretic. If I take a Vodafone, uh, Benzaprail, and Metoprolol. None of those are diuretics, actually. Okay. Well, I thought they were. I thought one of them, he told me one of them was, but I guess it might have been one he took me off of. Maybe, yeah. The amlodipine is what we call a calcium channel blocker, and it works on the blood vessels. The benazapril is an um, ACE inhibitor, and it works on the kidneys. And then the metoprolol is a beta blocker, and it works on the heart rate and lowering the heart rate and taking some of the pressure off the heart that way. So actually, none oh, okay. of those are diuretics. Well, I just, uh, I had to get up and use the bathroom about every two hours at night. I just wondered if one of them might be causing it. I didn't know. The only thing I would say is sometimes that benazapril can be com combined with a, um, a diuretic medicine, um, but it, it's mm -hmm. only benazapril. It doesn't say benazapril, hydrochlorothiazide, or anything like that. Uh, no, we just benzapril. Yeah, yeah. Then it, it doesn't sound like you do, so it may be something else going on. You may want to talk to your doctor about that if, it, if you're having to wake okay. up that often because none of those medicines should do that necessarily. Oh, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so hopefully this has been helpful with everybody with their blood pressure. Um, you know, like I said, lifestyle changes is going to be the biggest thing. Real quick before we get, we get off of the lifestyle changes, sodium, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be the biggest thing in our diet that we can change to help your blood pressure. So most Americans eat somewhere around 3,400 milligrams of sodium a day when the recommended dose is actually about 2,400 milligrams a day. And if you have high blood pressure, it's actually 1,500 milligrams a day. Um, and so we're eating about 3,400. So look at, whenever you're buying things, make sure you look at the labels, look for the sodium content. Um, if you're getting vegetables or fruits or anything like that that's canned, really try to wash those and rinse those. That helps lower the sodium count. And then avoiding processed foods. That's the other big thing to help lower your sodium. And then stay active. Make sure you're getting plenty of sleep. All of those things should help with your blood pressure. Thank you, everybody, for calling. We appreciate it. We had some great callers and some great questions. Thank you, Jay, for producing, and Charles for being our phone screener. Uh, this has been uh, Southern Remedy. It's funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and generous support from listeners like you. Don't MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.